Yeah, okay, listen. You just you just gave the little homie, you know what I mean? And you know, that's just the way we talk, because he's a man just a, just like us, same everything. So y'all understand, because you get these rat bastards and flip-flop wearing and public truths that is say say little homie, don't mean he's littler than us. Cause I right. got my other brother up here, Bootsy, and these are men that's younger than us, so we just say little, but they're just as big as we are in statue because they have the same seven and a half ounces of brain cell. <laughs> you not, understand? Not only that, they got this, they got the big brains and they got heart, you know, and they're thorough. Ain't no exactly. Lot, ain't no lot of thorough youngsters out there no more, uh, brother. So the ones that's relevant and the ones that count, we got to make sure we're on the same plane, man. All right, let me bring Eon up. I'm going to introduce them to Eon real quick, man. You know, this this is Eon. Eon, you ready, family? You know what I mean? And I got my man Bootsy. I'm going to bring him up, too, to show you, you know, our, 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 our soldiers that followed behind us that became generals and our equal. You know what my, I mean? Because my, they're from different generational gaps. But that don't mean when you say little that you're sunning them, we don't do none of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Here, go, here go the big homie, because even though he's younger than us, he got little homies that, you know, listen to him. And he's moving the youth, you know. Tell him who you are, Eon. What's up, unique slum leg around? Well, they can slum around. Uh, mm. You know, uh, I'm an author, uh, film producer. You know, I got to wear a couple hats, man. I miss the free to real. Mm. Okay, now fly. I'm gonna tell you how I met Eon, right? To show you how my travels went. I, I done been with Larry Hoover, everybody. You know what I mean, Matula Shakur, and you know. Those was the people that my ancestor, Marcus Garvey, wanted me to touch to make me into the man that I am today. Just like he allowed me to be there for you during your trying times and you was there for my trying times because I was going through it about my brother, too, because that was less than a year after my brother got killed. Right. I'm in Lee County, Virginia. And I see this light skin, thick little young brother sitting out there. And I see all the little, you know, DC dudes running wild. And his whole style was, was immaculate, was on some general time. You know what I mean? But he was a, he was a child. He was young. How old was you back then when we was in Lee County, um, you know, so they know? I got there. I was about 24. See, he's 24 years old. I'm like 34, maybe. Because that was a 2003 I was about 64, so I was damn near 40 years old. You know what I mean? So I was damn near double his age. But when I seen the way he was moving and we started kicking it, he told me that he wrote a book. I started writing my book of Roaring Harlem, but I didn't really take it serious. And he gave me a published book called Fast Lane. Make sure y'all go. Where's that book at, Eon? Oh, everywhere. Fast Lane. So you could always go to eonwilliams.com and get it too. Okay. All right. That's his thing flashing along the bottom of the screen. This is how we show love to our family over at Unique Mech Audio. This is for us. That's his right there at eonwilliams.com. Now, I read a book, Fast Lane, that took me beyond the walls of the prison for the time that I read it, where I was running through it because it was a page turner, then I had to slow it down, Fly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. I didn't want it to end. You know? So... Right. When I was done reading it, the first thing out of my mind is I went to see Eon and I told Eon, yo, you need to make this a couple of books. You know what I mean? Um, because there's so many different stories in this. You know, I don't know why I'm hearing this echo. Hold up. Oh, my man call. Yeah, um, it was so many different stories in it, but the book is fire. If you haven't read it, go read Fast Lane, man. That's one of the best books I ever read. And I'm not saying that because he here. I get flowers where it's due. Right, but right, right. me and Eon kicked it, and he told me what he was doing. And at the time, I was still, you know, moving hair around on the compound and coke. I'm still wild, and I'm going to keep it right. 100. You right. know what I mean? Smoking weed, you know? I'm doing me. But after seeing the way this young brother was moving, I sat back and... I took a page out of his book and I went and I focused on finishing my book, A Ruin Harlem. That's at Amazon and at uh, aruinharlem.com. But Eon is intricate in that, along with Cavario H that did the editing. But um, Eon kept the young men from DC that ran in his circle, just his circle, because he don't, 
he don't extend himself like that. He, he, he like us. But the men in his circle always show me respect and we could always have good educational dialogue to elevate ourselves beyond the war, beyond the war and to get better understanding of life. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to give you a round of applause. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you earned that. Appreciate it, man. You earned that. You know what I mean? All right, relax. You earned that, you know? Now, you know, tell us about what you went to jail for, Ian. I'm going to do a whole separate interview with you, but I just want to bring you up because Fly just gave you your flowers. So tell them, you know, what you remember about us meeting and how you, and be honest, I never asked you, but keep it 100. How did you view me when you met me in Lee County from your eyes? How did you view me? I'm going to give you the screen to yourself for that one. Me and Fly need to get off of this. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, to be honest with you, you know, uh, not to get into too many, like, stereotypes, but you cover all type of D.C., New York stereotypes. You cover all type of stereotypes that people have. I went to prison at 16. You know what I'm saying? I went to prison as a kid, basically. So me learning in prison was learning from listening to older people that had already been to the Fed. So, you know, I had been warned about white guys, New York guys, people from other sections of uh, the country, geographical sections, so to speak. But uh, I got cool with uh, New York Tech that was on the compound. He was cool with my man, Kobe Mowat. So that kind of like it, uh, you know, that kind of like it eased my uh, my stereotypical views of New York guys. And by the time I met you, you know what I mean? I have been on a, I've been on a United States penitentiary compound. Like a lot of times we talk about these, everybody said they've been to the feds. I'm not trying to take nothing away from nobody in the feds, but, you know, you might be able to cut the line at uh, Petersburg Low. You know, if you cut the line just a child in Lee County, you might get your head chopped off. So I was a young person in this type of environment. My morals, my principles, my values was different. So by the time that I met you, if you didn't come off as a man, which I salute you for, you know, I would have never even opened up my God for me and you to be walking and talking together. So, you know, I will say that you definitely, man, inspired me to feel like I had some type of jewel in the rough because a lot of my homies, they weren't on what we call urban fiction. So, you know, they was just encouraging me to do something positive because they saw me doing that. You know what I'm saying? I was a young homie that was on a compound that was, quote, unquote, creative. So, you know, that's my recollection of remembering you and meeting you. And I definitely know that uh, that D.C., New York thing, that, th that thing wasn't even active on that compound when I was there. And I don't know how things have changed in other years, but... D.C. and New York, they had no problems on that compound right there. <clears throat> I can't hear you, Unique. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm talking to my elder right now, you know. Yeah. Now nah, it's on. It, 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 it's on. They can hear me, you know. Now. So many people at the time they had it misconstrued it. You know, it's it's yours, Fly. Hey Fly, come out. If you can hear me, come out and come back in like you did before. You know? All right. Hold up. I, I hear you. Hold on. All right. Could you hear me now, Fly? You still can't hear me? All right, come out. I hear you. And I know, come out and come back in, Fly. Okay, let me take them off so we can finish this. Hey, Eon. Yeah. So tell them about your new book real quick while I hit Fly up and let them know to come back in. And Bootsy, don't go nowhere. All right? Yeah, I mean, if, uh, my latest book is a book called Hellraiser Honeys. And uh, it's just an installment of it, uh, really the end of a trilogy that I had. It was a book series that I had called Hellraiser Honeys. It was kind of popular. And uh, a lot of people enjoy part one and part two. And uh, I wrote part three to uh, kind of close out the whole scenario with that. So the fans said, man, enjoy it while I've been doing some other things. But Hellraiser Honey 3 is just uh, me going back to some of the roots that I started writing in and urban fiction that people liked it. I kind of moved on to do some other things. But I did finish that and I still had some other stuff for people that's really into urban fiction. I still got a few things for them. But, Can't hear you. What was it like for you, your first day walking in a USP compound? For you, what was it like for you? And be honest, 
Because you know we all nervous, but keep it 100. Nah, nah, it's all good for me. I've been asked that question several times. Once again, my 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 experience and my encounter as a USP is going to be different than most people. I was a part of a load. I was a part of loads with the S. Um, the new influx of the prisoners that came from Lawton during the closing of Lawton. So I didn't hit the United States Penitentiary until like 2002. I had been in prison almost nine years at the time. I've been in prison almost a decade. So I had been in prison and I had been around, you know, what goes on in Lawton. And I'm not going to reiterate all those things the to flat soldier about Lawton. I mean, it's understood. And I also wrote a book called Lawton Legends. It actually is a fictional uh, tale of, you know, life in Lawton. But nevertheless, my point is this. I got off a bus with 40 dudes from where I'm from. Most of those dudes I've been around for almost 10 years. Out of 40 of them, 15 of them had been active all over the system. Some had been to the feds before. It was already about three or 400 DC dudes there. So for me to walk into a United States penitentiary, it wasn't the regular old vibe of it when I walked into that United States penitentiary because it was like a baby Lord. It was almost 600 on the pound. It was almost 600 guys from DC on the pound for months and months. So, uh, it really wasn't a. It really wasn't a. It wasn't that same experience that I had when I walked through other places like Leavenworth or uh, Colorado and different places that I stopped in other places that was already established prisons. You know, at that point in time, you know, you know, you know how you have sections that you sit in. Uh, the sections that you sit in was kind of like you know they they was decided on those bus loads. The whole prison, the order of the prison was pretty much established on those bus loads. So you know DC kind of like established that whole prison, and that's not to take no credit for nothing. I'm just saying it was just an unfortunate timing of Lawton closing and us being stuck in all these private prisons for over. Well, probably I think I was stuck in private prisons for maybe six years. So I spent the last thirteen months in a place called. Sussex, Virginia, where they used to have a death row at. We're really across the street from where they used to have a death row at. So that's what it was like for me walking into a penitentiary. So I got to learn some penitentiary rules in an easier way than having to learn them straight up on the fly. Like when I say that, to say that, you know, the homies that I had that was there out of that 600, some of them have been to the feds. Like, you know, shout out to dudes like Trey and Rome and different guys, my big homie Bushwhack, stuff like that. These guys have been around already. So they had knowledge and information of how you do time. I didn't need no more information on how you do time in Lawton. I already understand that. And, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand when they speak about D.C. guys. There's two breeds of D.C. guys. Is is a breed of D.C. guy that's going to be your federal, you know, your U.S. code type of guy. His crime is going to be different. And then it's going to be your Lawton type of guys. And I came out, I came out of Lawton with a busload of Lawton guys. So our whole vibe was different. Okay, okay, okay. All right. You can hear me, family? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to bring up my little homie who's now a big homie, and he wants to ask, you know, I'm sure he got plenty of questions for Fly, but he might have some for you and me too because we're the youngest right now. So I'm just a little homie right now to the big homie. <laughs> All right. So let me bring the homie up. Take your mute off, Boots. You know? All right. Now. This my man Bootsy. Turn your camera sideways, family. Sideways? Yeah. That way you take up the whole screen. Just turn your phone sideways. There you go. Uh, now, that's my brother Eon Williams right there. He younger than me. Get tone party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. There you go. <laughs> Salute. Uh, Salute. Yeah, that, that, that's family. So that's the brother Eon right there, our brother, and that's our uncle right there. That's our godfather right there. That's no the doubt. big homie. That's the general, you know, Khalid mm -hmm. Mujahid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A.K.A. Fly. Now, I, I'm going to get off the screen. I want you to talk to Fly because you've been listening to the interview and you ask what you need to ask, you know what I mean, to Fly from what you heard so that it might be able to, to answer some of your questions and deter some of the youngins to think that it's cool to get caught up in the bull crap that we got caught up in and don't want to glorify it. All right? Yeah. So there you go, yeah. Fly. That's Boosie. Tell them who you are, Boosie. And, and tell them uh, about how you got locked up so you know they know you was in the system too. And, yeah. you know, you can tell them about, you know, when I got locked up and, you know, I was supposed to be there for you. I'm going to give you the floor right now to introduce yourself. All right, so that uh, my uh, my brothers over here could understand who you are. All right, facts. Well, first of all, I want to say uh, 
big up, big respect to uh to Fly, and well, and matter of fact, to both both of you guys up there, you know, it ain't being that you know you're a legend, and <clears throat> how you speak about you know the things you went through and all that. Um, it's not to glorify being in jail, but it's it's still a fact of being a legend now to be here to let these youth know what you was just saying. And I want to say I was sitting over here eating popcorn and, and enjoying what I was hearing, man, because it's serious how you how you say that the police will lie on you just to get a case and just to take a black strong man down. So I wanna I wanna get thumbs up to that and thumbs up to the to, to the homie that you know he said he listened to unique he wouldn't have never even let unique talk to him if he didn't think unique was you know of saint of sound mind the same as his and 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 a person that he could learn from so big ups to that and i really wanted to find out um real quick before i get into everything else was what what made you after you said yo you was wilding every day you just woke up with another day because you knew you had life and you was like institutionalized I want to know what made you say, yo, I got to stop this shit. I got to fight to get out of jail, man. That's what I want to know from Fly. Can you, you know what happened, brother? Let me tell you what happened to me, man. In 1995, when they scheduled me to go to trial, right? All the, not all the dudes, but a rack of dudes that I used to have with me every day in Lawton. Dudes that used to say, fly, I'll die for you. I used to pay their rent. I used to make my wife take the woman home. We never ate jail food, ate street food every night. The ones that smoke, I made sure they smoked. The ones that drink, I made sure they had a drink. I used to fight for them dudes. And man, some of the dudes that I thought Love me like family, marched up in that courtroom and got on that stand for the FBI and the government and pointed me out and say I did this for him, I did that for him. And everybody in the courtroom that was watching him walk, they said, Ain't that so and so? He gonna take the stand against Fly. And one day, brother, my sister, she says, A Muslim brother named Morris Salakon sitting back here in the courtroom and he said he want to come over to jail to visit you on a religious visit. So I said, yeah, right. I'm still arguing at the time. But I'm my mind is boggled seeing these dudes march up in that courtroom and take the stand and law my... One dude say he was my right-hand man so my daughter brought my ass hair around in the pussy. I told my lawyer, Subpoena his visiting record, man. We've got to prove that this dude is lying on my family. Make a long story short. The Muslim brother came over to jail to see me. His name is Mark Salakon. He, he got his own organization, but they do stuff for political prisons, like Mumil Jamal. And he said, man, you're so high profile. A lot of people have been studying you and watching this case. And they want to see why is the government coming after you? He was so profound and so prolific and so articulate the way he was talking. And this is why they come after Malcolm X. This is why they come after Nelson Mandela. That's why they come after Huey Newton, the Black Panthers, George. They hate brothers with power. So he say, it don't make no sense that these people coming after you and you've been in prison since 73. You ain't been on the street. His second visit, I said, brother, what do I need to do to become a Muslim? He said, you have to take your shahada. He said, but that's not my reason for coming to see you. I said, man, I think I need to become a Muslim because that gangster lifestyle ain't working for me. The way them dudes came in there on me, man, that I thought loved me, man. And we come out the dirt together and them dudes come lie on me like that, lie on my family. I said, I need to change my lifestyle. He said, you need to take your shahada. So I took my shahada. He said, you have to choose a name that fits your personality and your character. 
I'm going to send you some books. But I, used to, I, I had a girl used to call me Khalif anyway, a Muslim sister. I said, my first name going to be Khalif. My middle name going to be Abdul Kwawi, the strong. My last name going to be Mujahid, a fighter in the way of Allah. I took my Shahada brother, went back to my cell and faced the east and I started crying, praying to Allah. I went back to the feds and I told all my homies, I said, man, hey, I'm a Muslim now. I ain't cursing. All that all fitting out. They said, go ahead, man. You stuck. You trying to pull a move. I said, man, I'm serious. I got to change my life. I said, man, because all that tough guy stuff, all that old gangster stuff, man, and running stuff, they just got me life. And dudes that I thought was loyal to me and loved me, just went to the grand jury on me and took the stand in my trial, man. It pointed me out, my mother out, my sister out, my daughter out, my friends out. So I said, man, I got to do stuff different because that gangster lifestyle ain't working. And you see so many dudes that you thought was good, strong men and dudes that was millionaires and ran stuff. They start flipping. Look at the Alpos, the Raven Edmonds, the Nicky Barnes. All them dudes was rich, man, and they wound up being rats. So I said, I'm through with that game. I'm going to turn. And then another brother who was my family member, he was to be the grand sheik of the more science, he used to say, why don't you use your power for righteousness instead of evil? You got so much power. Won't you use it for good? And once I became a Muslim and started practicing this faith and learning that my place on this earth is to serve Allah, not shaitan, because all them wicked, evil things I was doing and knocking dudes out every day and breaking people's jaw. You know what I mean? I said, man, I got I, I got to start doing some good. And then you get rewarded for your good deeds. So once I start praying five times a day and changing my life and start seeing the light, how Shaitan want us to do evil, wicked stuff. They want us to hurt each other. They want, look at them young dudes out there uh, keep on carjacking people and mothers and daughters and sisters. And for the car, just a joy ride, and then they crash the car. Now in D.C., they, they, they robbing people for the little French bulldog. A woman came home, was walking up the steps, dude jumped out of the car, ran, I said, give me that dog, B. She said, please, they're punching women in the face on buses. Man, we got to stop these youths, man, from self-destructing. I don't know, but they don't have no guidance. They don't have nobody to say. Just like me and Unique said about that ADX, you look at the sky every day. No civilization. Is a torture chamber. And they said, you're going to die here in one of these cells. And when I won, my lawyer just started crying. All the family, they said, man, you coming home. That's because I changed my lifestyle. That's because I started praying every day and asking the Lord to forgive me for all my wicked ways and accept my repentance for all the evil I've done, man. So we got to start, man, trying to reach out and reach some of these youths, man. And get them on a different path because, man, you know how I go to go to jail to have two or three little girlfriends, have babies here and there. And then when your little women run off and your children get raised by another dude, a lot of them dudes there and them jumps, they go crazy. They can't do it. They can't take it. The... Man, it, it, it's a shame that these dudes don't realize, man, that's what they want. They want them to keep killing each other. You killed him, we lost black life. You give him life with no parole. So we, we got rid of two. It's self-destruct. We got to start doing something to try to reach these youths, man. I don't want nobody in jail. See my point? So we got to do what we got to do, man. This is why we need this platform. That's a fact. Every so, day I come out, I can tell you, every day I go all over D.C. and do this. Welcome home, champ. We, we seen you on Eon's page. They say, man, we seen you on Eon page hitting the bag. You still shop, man. We know your story. Welcome home, champ. So, man, we got we got to do what we got to do, man, to try to reach some of these youths, man. 
so they won't spend the rest of their lives in them jail cells, man. Yeah, so where I come from, <clears throat> 1992, you know, uh, I ended up, you know, I met Unique <clears throat> through one of my friends. I used to just see him riding around through Harlem, and I used to be like, and you know, AZ, <clears throat> I was working, you know, around with AZ and all them back in the days, and when AZ left the game, I still was out there, you know, like AZ is like a, a, a the person that I looked up to at the time. When he left the game, I was stayed in the game. So, you know, I was regulating with me and my little homies. And I seen Unique ride by something new every, like every other day and stuff like that. And I seen one of my homies that was with him. So I was like, yo, I said, yo, who's, uh, who homie you be being with riding up and down and, you know, being in the park and, and, he, and he told me who he was. I said, man, I need to meet him. Long story short, he, he introduced me to Unique. So <clears throat> I met Unique. And I told him what I can do. And he, he was like, all right, homie, co-sign for you. He, he gave me a shot. And, I, you know, I kept it 1,000 with him, go back. You know, normally niggas will disappear with the money, all kind of story. But he realized that I was about my business at a, at a young, early age. And, you know, so we continued making moves together. And it was one particular time something had happened to the money. And I'm just giving this story real quick to, to, to show, you know, uh, Back then, how we had loyalty at young age and what doing all the crazy killing each other stuff. So I had, I didn't know how to tell them that the money got messed up, nine thousand dollars, and I'm and 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 my normal routine was to be there in a couple of days, and I wasn't. It was about two weeks, and I got my nerve up to go to him like a man and say, "Yo, man, money got fucked up, but I'm gonna take care of that." And he said, "I already knew something right because you ain't come back." He said, "I wasn't gonna come looking for you for that no little nine thousand dollars." He said, but as long as you make it right, then we good. I went, I made it right, came back, gave him the money, and he looked at me like, 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 like a strong man. We ain't never looked back. We was everywhere together and doing things, parties, all, all of the above. So I learned from Unique how to make myself, uh, you know, as far as loyalty and making move, making sure your team is all right. Because if your team ain't right, they'll turn on you. And stuff like that. So long story short, I get caught up down where you guys is at. I, I leave New York because the police was on us too crazy. So I'm like, I got to go somewhere else and do something. I, so 1992, I started going down to VA, Newport News. I was taking Route 13 and they was doing railroad and pulling people over illegally and searching and all that in Maryland. And I in Salisbury, Maryland is where I got caught up at. And once I got in there, I was facing uh, 60 years. They was they they put the paper right in front of you. You, you give us up, tell us something, and you know we we work with you and all that because you're facing 60 years. So mad niggas from New York was up and down the road getting caught up. I get in there, everybody was in there telling. They was giving niggas 20 years for a little pebble crack rock. Niggas grown men coming back crying got 20 years. I'm like, damn, I'm from New York. These niggas gonna slay me for all the shit they found with us, but. We went in there, me and my co-defendants went in there. We did no telling, no talking, no nothing, held it down strong. But Unique was, my, I had a million dollar bell in there. And I had my mom, my brother and them get up with Unique and tell him to come to my mother's house. I need to need to talk to him. He goes to my mom's house and he gets on the phone. And, and I told him that my bell was a million dollars. And he was like, all right, I'm coming to get you. Don't worry about it. And I always known him to be a man of his word. So now I'm sitting back waiting to pack my bags. Week go by, two weeks go by. I'm like, damn, man, I'm calling my moms. I'm like, mom, you ain't heard from him. I ain't heard from him. Baby's phone going to voicemail, all of the above. Um, So one of my homies get caught up on th Route 13 and come in there and I, that I grew up with. And I see him in there. I'm like, so we talking. It's about a month now. And we, he was like, yo, man, that's messed up. What happened to your bro Unique? I was like, what you mean? What happened to him? He's like, man, the feds jumped out on that nigga and, and snagged him. I'm like, that's why this nigga ain't come wild. So I end up having to, you know, stay. I said, I just let, laid on down to just wait to, to go to trial. So I go to trial, I take a jury, I take a judge trial. Because by law, we didn't sign no paperwork for them to search the car. So I'm thinking a judge going to abide by the law. They ain't want to do none of that. That judge knew we was guilty before we was even sat, sat in that courtroom that he was sending us back. So I ended up in Jessup in the cut. 
So I was down your way in the cut, and they uh I got five years from it. When you was going to to uh to trial, I was getting out in '95. So I went and did my I got out and I moved. My mom's had moved back to North Carolina, so I started going to North Carolina, and I got back up with Unique while he was in there. So what I did was hold my brother down the whole 26 years he was in there after I got back in touch with him. And, you know, that loyalty thing is what makes us powerful. And what's going on right now with the youth is no more loyalty is above. The snitch game is the end thing now to do. And people don't understand. Most of them understand, well, if I get locked up, I'm, I got to get these cars, money, girls. If I get locked up, I just find somebody to tell on. That's embedded in, in them now. And the, and the big homies to these little guys out here are just somebody that probably got a good fight game, but no smarts. So they following the big homies that don't have no smarts and they just a thorough person out here and sending them on dummy missions and got them doing dumb stuff. Because what you just said, I always tell niggas, like, if you the head of the bloods and you got so-and-so amount of dudes with you, you know how much more money you could get by sending them to do the right thing? For instance, a party, get some flies together. You got 10, 15 dudes. Each one of them can bring 10, 20, 30 people. You charge the 30, 40, 50 at the door. Everybody out passing flyers out. They'll start generating some money. And then they mind will be somewhere else. But nobody is thinking like that. And half these dudes don't even know the law. So when they get in there, they, they, they mind and their mental is messed up. So what I'm about to create right now is a program that will teach these kids their, uh, the constitutional law and about the and i know a lot of lawyers that i knew was in doing interns and they was in college and stuff like that i'm about to start calling them out why y'all not coming teaching these kids we don't need y'all to teach them you know, everything you learned in college we know you went to college spent money and you got to get paid and all that because they'll sit around and watch their homeboys get money and wait for them to have to call them to, to get them out of jail or one of their sons get their sons or daughters out of jail instead of doing something once a week at a community center and teach these kids um, these first and second and third amendments because that's another thing how the police is killing the kids because they thinking they ain't doing nothing wrong when they start arguing and fighting back. But if the police pull up on them and they know how to say, yo, I got freedom of speech. Um, my, you, you can't search my car. And they know how to spit it back to them. And if they learn to just put your hands behind your back, don't never fight. More of them going to come. It eventually it's going to turn to something, they shoot you and kill you. You handcuffed, beat you down. Now you're dead. Just put your hands behind your back. We got to create that type of system. Put your hand behind your back. Get in the car. Know that you're going to be on. You, you're going to get, it's going to be a lawsuit if they violate your rights. Don't give them a chance to say obstruction of justice. You was re resisting arrest and all of the above. You don't have to give your ID if you're in a passenger seat. If they pull the driver over, you don't have to say who you are at all unless they have a particular reasonable of suspicion to think you did a crime if you ain't do a crime and you wasn't driving no car or you was out on a public property you don't have to give no id and you tell them i don't want to answer questions period and these lawyers need to start passing their cards out so kids know that they got a lawyer on standby as well so i'm gonna do something at, at i got a spot down here we getting ready to uh do something like once a week and I'm gonna show them videos of these police, how they violate people so they can learn and see how it actually happens. And with these guys that do cop watching and they talk to the police and tell them, I don't have to answer your questions. No, I don't got to show you ID. The kids need to see this. So at least some, some videos a week and then, you know, have them study their first, second, third amendment. So they know how to talk to these police and it'll reduce our kids getting killed out here, man. So that's what that's another thing that I'm starting to you know implicate with with what uh me and Unique doing. Because when Unique first started, he was doing good and he he came home full blast and and trying to push his channel and pushing it. He was getting good numbers. And then I said, bro, we gotta go take you to a high platform. And my thing is take my brother to a high platform. I'm not gonna hide it if I got the insight. Let my brother get back on his plateau. Cause once again, now my brother and I didn't have mine. Uh, uh, my YouTube page up yet, and I was already on 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 Queen's Flip, and I was did about half a million views. If I had my page up, I would have been straight. So I took the insight I had and gave it to my brother, and he went up there. And I'm like, yo, and after he got off that page, mad mad people start going 
to his page and he started, we started preaching that, um, you know, we got to save the youth and he ain't never looked back. And he found this niche to tell these stories to these kids. You got to paint that picture. And we ain't painting no pictures to look like going to jail is, is glorified. We ain't painting no picture that selling drugs is, is the thing to do because it's not. And, and, and another thing, when you were saying about how the, the, the police is on you so bad that they, that they'll do anything and get up there and lie and, and, and send you to jail. And, and right now as we speak, I'm going through a situation. They violated my house, came in through bombs in there, all of the above, just because they wanted a person. They seen me speak to him and shake his hand. And it was the ATF. And then they utilized the regular uh, Raleigh police to come all the way from Raleigh. I don't even live in Raleigh. I don't even hang in Raleigh like that. I don't even hang in, in Durham. Like I go there if I got something to do. And But mostly I'll be in my house and I've been in my house. And they came all the way in my house and took me downtown. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing in a car for, for a federal charge? We've been stopped doing that knucklehead stuff. But they took me down and asked me about this guy and asked me, did I drive in his car? And I'm thinking, it's a federal case. I'm like, he don't got no cars. And they was like, so you ain't never seen him? I'm thinking it's Flyboy cars. Every time I see him in some like, hoopties and stuff like that. And he owned stores and shit like that. He used to tell me. And I'm thinking he fronting that he, he got it like that. But he was just a homie from the hood. And he'll see me and hit me up here and there. And then he might say, all right, I'll talk to you later. I don't talk to him and see him. In, in, in a month or two or three weeks. But they said, oh, so you don't see him drive no cars. And they pull out a camera phone and flick it and show me it with a picture. Nothing in my hands. It looked like I'm walking away. And they was like, so you don't know that van? I said, yeah, I know that van. But what they got to do with y'all busting up in my house, man? <clears throat> Mind you, I told them I want a lawyer before I even sat down in that motherfucker. They still wanted to start asking me questions. <clears throat> so I told them, I don't, so what? What that van got to do with me? And then they said they was watching them since September and they ran across me in January talking to them. That's against the law. You can't put no, and they put a track on me. You can't put a track on nobody. I'm not in the hood. Ain't no niggas screaming my name that I'm, they getting work for me and all the above. So how y'all even got a trapping? They came in my house with a warrant. Nothing is on the warrant. Not what they coming to look for. My name ain't on the warrant. Nothing. So they wanted me to get down there and start telling on him and see if I knew something about him or whatever. And they got frustrated and kicked me out of the office, told me to go the fuck back in there. And that's what I did. Cause y'all fucking with the wrong one. So now I got a lawsuit out on them, hundred million dollar lawsuit on, on the ATF and, and uh, the Raleigh police. And so now uh, with my new lawyer, they denied me the, to, the right to, to fire the public defender. When I told them I got a lawyer, they said, well, the lawyer needs to be here. No, it don't. If I say I want to fire him, you fire him, you let him go right here, judge. But now it's been eight months. I ain't even talked to this lawyer a one-on-one -on -one about nothing. I don't have no, I don't have a motion to discovery. I have nothing. I don't, and, and now my name ain't even in their docket as a new court date. The lady told it to me out of her mouth, the DA wouldn't have come back uh, on the 8th, but it's not in the system. And I've been going to the system. I've been going to the clerk of court. I've been staying on their ass about this case. I'm still not in in, in there. They planned, they, they added new charges, which they ain't supposed to after four or five months. And they put the date on it as if the new charges, I got arrested on them that same day that they arrested me. And they added that. They, they tampering with documents. My social security number's flat out straight out it shouldn't be straight out it's supposed to have x's on it and one of the numbers is, is wrong so that ain't even my social security number my address on some of the documents is a whole nother address I ain't even over here on a bunch of the documents so now they, they I, I i guess they know that i'm fighting back and they seeing that whatever they was trying to do i ain't going for it. so i don't know at the end of the day, what's about to happen? Because I, my, I ain't even on the court document. I'm gonna go in there the day that she said come in there, but it wasn't, it wasn't, um, I didn't, it wasn't said to me in front of the judge, so it ain't on the record. And mind you, I forgot to say, they, I was supposed to go to court December first, so my lawyer could come in because I ain't use a lawyer from this this city. I use a lawyer from somewhere else because I know they all sticking together around. I'm not going for that because. We going to trial, and I don't got time for no lawyer that wanted to do cop outs. I'm not. We not doing no cop outs. So, um, they my December first, I was supposed to go. 
they pushed my court date back to um to November 27th. Didn't come that lawyer ain't contact me or nothing. They sent it in the mail. It wasn't certified mail, nothing. What if I ain't checked the mail? Um, it could have got lost in the mail. Then I would have got a bench warrant, and I'm out on a hundred thousand dollar bond. They would love for me to get locked back up. Only reason why I knew was because I went to see my probation officer, and she said, "Okay, everything is good," because I don't really do that. I don't, I don't smoke. I don't get high. None of that stuff. Um, so now, and I paid all the money up. So really, I'm on probation to be on there trying to get off early. So she told me my court date was the 27th. I went to the clerk of court got that paperwork and it said the 27th when i was supposed to go on december 1st and nobody contacted me so now i'm seeing they're trying to snake and railroad and i'm only saying all this so these kids that is listening pay attention to your case because they are trying and don't do all that talking just do more being active in your case and when i went there to the clerk recorded damn sure was the 27th and it had my regular two charges that i've been having for four months on there so then when I go back another time, I see extra charges up there. And they didn't know that I had papers already with the regular two charges with the dates on it. And they it's showing that they tampering with the paperwork and trying some slick stuff, man. So yeah, bro, you 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 absolutely right. We gotta we gotta fight for these kids because they ain't know they not knowing the law and they going in there getting messed up. All right, hold, hold up, Boosie. Go ahead, uh fly. I'll say something. Man, you are very intelligent. You know the law. And whatever you do, don't go in there with no lawyers that ain't going to do what you tell them to do. Facts. You know what I mean? You got to mention. See, that's how me and Eon be talking. Eon be saying, fly, I know the law. I know, I know my rights. I ain't going to let them do anything to me. Man, I'm glad you were unique, man. Y'all got to stay on top of each other. You said something, man. That's the key and one of the main principles that I live by now. Loyalty. Right. If you don't have loyalty, man, from those that you embrace, those that supposed to be in your circle, you ain't you ain't got nothing. Loyalty. Me, me, me and uh Nasir, Wayne Perry, we used to talk about that every day. Loyalty, man, is the key to survival. Cheers, cheers, the crime, 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 the cr
so we can give back to the youth them, cause they the truth them, and bless up to all the rude men. Hey.